music chair. Well, you, you opened your door to me, and, and you, I saw a man paint every day with a flurry of activities all around you, and people coming and going, and you and me just sitting there talking, drinking coffee, and you inspired me because of your passion for your experience of life in the Arctic, your time with the Inuit, and your true desire to bring about a knowledge that the uh, Western civilization, including myself, didn't really understand. And, and one of your phrases, you wanted to let Canadians know more about Canada. And that's what really uh, excited me about being in your presence. And yeah, could you talk more about that? What was your inspiration into doing all of this? Yeah, I can. In fact, in order to get the right context on the whole thing, get some perspective on it, the story actually begins on a cliff. Halfway down this cliff was an old, old Portuguese whaler who had a fishing shack inside the cliff. And this old man in this cliff told me stories of when he was a young fellow about going to the Arctic and whaling at, in Baffin Island. And those stories so compelled me, so utterly took over my life. And I decided when I get big, I'm going there. And all I could think of was this. It just took over my life entirely. And so eventually, the things in Portugal politically were very, very shaky. The dictatorship was on its last legs. Things were getting ugly. We had to get my dad out of the country. The worried authorities uh, saw him as a threat and uh, they tried to get rid of him by ugly means. Anyway, he was gotten out of the country. A uh, Canadian ambassador helped our family greatly and we came to Canada. And then I realized I was further away in Vancouver from the Arctic I wanted to go to than I had been in Lisbon, Portugal, for God's sake. <laughs> anyway, ended up in the Arctic. And I was looking for Eskimos. And I had never, never seen one. I had never heard or met anybody who had met one. And I was beginning to wonder if I'd had my leg pulled really badly that these people didn't actually exist. However, I did find out, I did encounter them in a place that we now call Copper Mine, very close by there, at a place called Bloody Falls, where there had been a very nasty skirmish way back in Nassau's Bay, 30 days, and uh, where a lot of people, they knew it, were killed. And it was there that I met the first group, and they were called Inuit, not Eskimos. Eskimos is an, a very bad word, and it has the same sort of type of connotation as the N-word has for, for black people. And so I encourage no one and no one to use the word Eskimo. Mm -hmm. it, they took over my life, one grandma took over my life, and after questioning me severely for a long period of time with a grandson who did speak English, who had escaped residential school, and I was soon to learn that what they were was refugees in their own land. They were running away from authority to keep their children out of residential school. I traveled with these people and they introduced me to many other people, but this grandma became one of those features of a human's life. Old man Francisco in Portugal and this inner grandmother. And for the next five and a half years, I spent with them and learning and traveling and seeing what was what up there. I saw the most beautiful things that one cannot imagine. They were too beautiful. And I saw ugliness beyond imagination in the other direction. And eventually, if I wasn't gonna stay there and marry into them, which was certainly what was wanted, but if I was gonna go back to my world, then my job was to go and tell people what you'd seen and experienced. I thought, well, I'm not important. I'm just a painter in a drawer of drawings. What kind of importance would anybody lend to a fellow who in this continent we call an artist? I don't perceive myself as an artist. I'm a painter. I did return to the South, and I spent a lot of time trying to tell the stories about what I'd encountered. And all I managed to do is make people angry until I realized that people do not want to talk about indigenous matters at all. And they don't want to talk about cold places like the Arctic because their holidays are all in sandy beaches with palm trees. Mm. They weren't going anywhere. Anyway, so I set about making a fortune to spread the word. And I did that, I spent it, and failed. I did it again, same results. Eventually, I decided that I had the right idea, but I was in the wrong place, which was Vancouver and West Coast. I went to Toronto, which is downtown Canada, where both the political and the industrial decisions are made. Ottawa may be the capital, 
but Toronto gives us its marching orders. And so I went to the one place that unites the whole country by apparently disliking it. <laughs> I found ridiculous, and the people of Toronto treated me like gold, and I shall be forever thankful and grateful to them. I, I found out what the people were saying hither and thither across the country was not true. And over the time that I launched into painting the world's largest portraits as a way of getting attention. And it eventually turned into a 50 ring circus, as you know. I mean, your music, and you came, you came to the club and we had a very good time together and I, I think of it very fondly. And so what we did is we brought people of our own kind together, which is usually a pretty good thing to do. And it's at that point that it's almost like subatomic particles. It's like uh, quantum mechanics. You cannot predict the outcome of things like this. You can try, but in our minds and our souls as they are today, they're too frail to understand what the outcome might be. What the outcome was is to this day something that makes me wake up in cold sweat in the middle of the night. <laughs> I, I sit up in bed and uh, my wife, my new wonderful wife, Nana, can attest to this, did it really happen? What on earth, how did that happen? It's like it's a mystery, even though it happened to me. And that to stand in a parliament, an immigrant wearing cowboy boots, having removed his tie and thrown his jacket on the floor and address everybody. And then at a certain a while later, there were hugs and kisses and tears. All I said was, I am here because a grandma insisted that I come and talk to you and tell a story that you need to hear. Understand the quiet wisdom of the inner grandmother who taught me the meaning of the Sumatak. She explained that a nation is composed of its landscape and its people. For a nation to be great, it must know, respect, and understand itself. In my opinion, 90% of Canadians don't know 90% of Canada. How can we be a nation if we don't know our own backyard? Let us at least be as patient with each other as the Aboriginal peoples of this place have been with us. Sumatang is an invitation and it is a demand. Let's join each other and be worthy of this place. Let's go forward with a single purpose and a good will. I dedicate Sumatang to all Canadians and to all Canada, from sea to sea to sea. Thank you very much. And we should all listen to our grandmas. You who are not so fortunate as I have two. I have three. I'm adopted by her and her people. And I learned more from them than from my own buddy Francisco, the peasant fisherman in Portugal, than all the great teachers that I have had combined. And so I'm here as a very simple man, as an ordinary guy, speaking on behalf of all of us to please, for God's sake, stop the madness up there, treat these people correctly, and let's make amends. <laughs>